Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, we're glad to have everybody in with us, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, we just want to welcome you, and uh, whether you're morning, afternoon, or evening that you're watching the show, we, uh, we just say good morning, whatever. And uh, again, we just trust that you'll take your Bibles and uh, your notes and study with us, because after all, that's the whole purpose of our teaching, is that you learn how to use the Word of God and to compare Scripture with Scripture, because uh, there is so much confusion out there today. You know, our communications are terrific. The Internet, I guess, is unbelievable. But you see, the more information you go up there, the more opportunity for confusion. And uh, I can just tell from our letters and our phone calls that uh, it's running rampant. And so all we hope to do is just simply teach people to look at the Word. And uh, don't even just rest on what Les Feldick says. You go by what the book says. And I can't emphasize that enough. Don't rest on a denomination because denominations are, for the most part, man-oriented. And uh, so even if you have to sometime blink your eyes a little bit, go to the book. And uh, that's your only safe way of going at it. All right. I think we'll dispense. If with any further announcements, we'll go right into where we left off in Hebrews. We we're in the last verse of chapter 6. And uh, I probably should finish it. I didn't really bring it to the end like I wanted to. And so I'm going to bring you back to verse 20 for just a moment or two before we go into up here. We've got uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. And yeah, Iris just reminding me again. Now, today's programs are the beginning of book 50. So for those of you out in television, if you want to order a tape or video or something with today's program, just tell us that you are interested in book or tape number 50. Which means, how many times have we already come to Tulsa to tape? 150 times, huh? Goodness, unbelievable. And to think when we started, we thought maybe three or four, and that would be it. <laughs> but uh, the Lord has blessed it tremendously. All right, back to Hebrews then, chapter 6. And let me put a few more comments on verse 20 by virtue of some of our break time comments. Otherwise, I was ready to go into chapter 7. All right, getting back to that word forerunner. Verse 20, whither the forerunner, the captain, or the author of our salvation, Jesus the Christ, has for us entered, and he has been made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, of course, I've always emphasized, and I'm going to bring us back, honey, to 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 4. Because for those of us in this age of grace, we are in a totally different scenario than Israel was in Christ's earthly ministry. And so I'm going to bring you back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul makes a statement that a lot of people don't like. But on the other hand, as I have stressed over the years, you want to remember when people say, well, I follow Jesus. Now, that, that, that's making some pretty strong statement because, and uh, I don't say it to be uh, superfluous or anything like that, but... I would put it this, now wait a minute, if you're going to follow Jesus, what are you going to do when he came to the shore of Galilee and kept going? You can't follow him. You, you can't walk on water. And the same way with a lot of things that he did in his earthly ministry, see. But here we have the apostle of the Gentiles, the apostle Paul, who never, never attempts to take the place of Christ in anything. In fact, that's all Paul suffered for for 25 years, was to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. But here he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, <clears throat> and take this to heart, because after all, all of our doctrines for this age of grace come from the pen of this apostle. Now that doesn't mean, as I've said over and over on this program, we don't throw the Old Testament away. You don't throw the Gospels away. You don't throw away the book of Revelation or any of that. But when it comes to basic doctrines for us in this age of grace, Paul is the apostle 
for the Gentiles. So he says in verse 16, Wherefore I beseech you, I beg you, be ye followers, he doesn't say of Jesus, but of who? Of me. All right, now what does he mean by that? Now you've got to turn and look at another verse, which is in chapter 11, verse 1. Now, this should make it easier to swallow. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, where again the admonition is. You all got it? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, already. He writes, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am or follow Christ. So it stands to reason that the apostle is not taking anything away from Christ's leadership or from the fact that he is the captain of our salvation. But you want to remember that as Paul came in, he too was the head of the line of lost sinners saved by grace, as he makes so plain in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And that was in him first that these great doctrines of grace based on the finished work of the cross became known. And so since he is the one to whom all these things were revealed, you see, this is why the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, Be ye followers of me. Because Paul is the one who has truth for this day and age. All right, now then, let's just finish verse 20 and get ready for chapter 7. So wherefore the forerunner, the Lord Jesus himself, is the one who opened it up. And as most of you know, that when uh, the darkness fled and Christ gave up the ghost there back in the crucifixion, what happened to the veil at the temple? Well, it was rent in twain. Not from the bottom up where men could have done it, but from the top down showing that it was an act of God. Well, this is all tied together that as he opened up then the veil... And we are now given access into the very throne room of God, but we do it through the teachings of the Apostle Paul, who was our particular leader as a member of the human race. All right. <clears throat> now, chapter 7, verse 1, we come back to Melchizedek. Now, I say back to because, turn back a page with me, up there in chapter 5, Verse 10, in fact, let's look at verse 9, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, and being made perfect or totally complete, he brought everything to fruition, he became the author, there's that word again, instead of captain, he became the author or the beginner of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But then we drop Melchizedek. Not another word is spoken throughout all of chapter 6 or the rest of chapter 5 until we get 7. Now why? Well, next verse in Hebrews 5, verse 11. These people were not ready for any teaching concerning Melchizedek. They were too unspiritual. They were still babes in Christ. They couldn't comprehend this priesthood of Melchizedek. And I imagine that's most of church people today. Most people haven't got a clue as to this priesthood of Melchizedek and who he was and what he accomplished. And here's the reason, see? Verse 11, of whom he says, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing... You are dull of hearing. They weren't ready for anything concerning Melchizedek. And then he goes on and he brings them to task that even though they should have by now had enough handle on all these things to go out and teach others, could they? No. No, they, they couldn't teach anybody. They didn't know it themselves. And so everything down through here and then all the problems that we covered with those who were apostate up in chapter 6 and all these other things, he had to bring them down to the place where we just finished now in chapter 6 that they now understood. They now understood that the way into the holiest of all had been opened up 
because of what Christ had accomplished on the cross. And so now then, if we understand that much, hopefully we're ready to study Melchizedek. Now that's the way we have to look at it. All of a sudden, it's dropped. We deal with the uh, carnal believers, the believers who were not steeped in the Word until we get to the end of the chapter where hopefully they're getting there. And so now then, we come back to Melchizedek. Verse 1 of chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Now, if you don't mind marking your Bible, underline those three words. The Most High God. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also, verse 2, Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation the king, capitalized, the king of righteousness, but also after that the king of Salem, which means in the Hebrew, shalom, he was the king of peace, and then without father and so forth. But let's go back and pick it up first in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, where we're introduced for the first time to this high priest of the Most High God. In the Hebrew, I think it was El Elyon. Hebrew, uh, Genesis chapter 14, starting at verse 17. Now, we're going to take this rather slowly because, uh, like Paul indicates you can't understand these things concerning Melchizedek if you don't have a pretty good handle on mature spiritual things. The novice can't get a handle on it. All right, verse 17 of Genesis 14. Now the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that is Abraham, after his return <clears throat> from the slaughter of the Chedorlaomer, who had invaded Sodom and Gomorrah and had taken Lot and all of his family with him. And so after the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him at the valley of Shavah, which is the king's dale. Verse 18. And as Abraham is coming back, having been victorious, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, Shalom, the king of peace, which, of course, are the last letters of the city of Jerusalem. All right, so Melchizedek, the king of Salaam, or which would be the city of Jerusalem in a later day, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, that's a term that is never used concerning the children of Israel. The children of Israel were more acquainted with the term Jehovah or El Shaddai. But the most high God, you see, as I've stressed in other lessons, is the term of God that was not unique just to Israel, but to the whole of creation. He's the most high God of everything. Jehovah is primarily the God concerning Israel. But this is the Most High God. And you'll see this throughout Scripture. All right? I'm going to make a couple points before we leave and chase it down. We have this first introduction to Melchizedek with Abraham here at about 2000 B.C. Now, I say about because we don't know within 100 years or so. But here we're introduced to this high priest and Most High God at about 2000 B.C., now, I might as well follow the scriptures so that you'll follow me there, and then we'll come back. Now, if you'll jump all the way up to Psalms 110. Psalms 110. And I think it's verse 7, 4. Psalms 110, verse 4. No mention of him in between. From Genesis to Psalms. And now the psalmist writes. Y'all got it? Psalms 110 verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
Now let me give you a thought-provoking question. How many years have passed by since Abraham was introduced to the priest of the Most High and until David puts it here in the Psalms? How many years? A thousand, thereabouts. A thousand years have gone by from Melchizedek introduced to Abraham until David. Now then, how many years went by from David until Paul brings him up again in Hebrews? Another thousand. Thousand year intervals that we are introduced to this high priest Melchizedek. Amazing, isn't it? All right, now then let's come back to Genesis and uh, let's just pick this apart a little further. Now this Melchizedek the priest of the Most High God meets Abraham and he brought forth bread and wine. Now, number one, was it a practical gift? You don't know what I'm driving at. How many people are in this particular little unit with Abraham at this time? How many soldiers did he take out of his hired help? Huh? 300. 300. See? So he's had 300 men who have just come back from battle and they're famished and they're thirsty. And so in the physical realm, what does this Melchizedek provide? Food and water for his troops, see? But then it goes so much further than that. Where does bread and wine become a high point in the life of the believer? Well, it's the Lord's table. The Lord's table and what did it speak of? His shed blood and his broken body. And so all these things have ramification. Now, we don't see anything concerning Melchizedek in the operation of God and Israel because Melchizedek is not in the line of Levi and the priests of Israel. He's the priest of the Most High God who was not just the priest of Israel. He was the priest of all. And that's what I want people to see. This Melchizedek was the high priest of the Most High God. Now, we've done this before, but I'm going to do it again. Turn up with me now to Daniel. Because I want you to see that we have no references to Melchizedek's priesthood throughout Israel's history because Israel wasn't connected, per se, with the Most High God. Now, don't take me too literal on that. Of course, the Most High God was the same God as Jehovah and El Shaddai and all that. But in terms of language for our own understanding, we have these different names of God. The same God. They're not different. They're the same one. But in the role in the operation, God has given us these different nomenclatures to show that he is dealing differently with the non-Jew as he is with the nation of Israel. All right, here in Daniel chapter 4. Start with verse 1. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. First word, Nebuchadnezzar, Jew or Gentile? Gentile. A Gentile. So follow him. So Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages. Is that just Israel? Now I think most of you, especially if you've been watching the, the programs lately in the morning on the book of Acts, what do I stress? Is there any Gentile language in here? Remember? No, there's no Gentile language in, in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4. It's all Jewish. Now I can ask the same question in reverse. Are there any Jews in here? This is Gentile, see? And so he says, The king to people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. He's not talking directly to the Jew. He's talking to the nations. All right, verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar says, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath shown toward me. Who's he talking about? The most high. High God, of whom Melchizedek was the high priest. All right, you can come on over in that same chapter to verse 17. Now, this isn't by accident. This is by design. The intricacy, again, of the Scriptures. And that's what the secular world can't get a handle on. That everything is so 
in, intricately put together. Now in verse 17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Drop down to verse 34. Same chapter. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, the Gentile king, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. He's the Most High God. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All right, I got one more while we're in Daniel chapter 5, verse 18. Because I want to drum this into you that this is a term or a name of God as he is associated with the non Jewish world. Verse 18. Now, I probably should qualify that. Yes, the Jews are part of the whole big picture, but they are more concerned with Jehovah God and El Shaddai and some of these others. But the Most High is always connected with the non-Jewish world. Verse 18 of chapter 5, O thou king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and Glory. Now you can go all the way through Scripture then that whenever you have a reference of the Most High God, we're dealing with the non-Jewish world. And that's why uh, Paul speaks of it now with regard to the Melchizedek priesthood back there in Hebrews that he was the priest of the Most High God. All right, let's come back to Genesis. Back to Genesis. Because when the scripture repeats and repeats and repeats, it's for a reason. It's not here just to fill the page. Back to Genesis 14. Verse 19 now. And so he blessed him. And he said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Now you want to remember, has the nation of Israel appeared yet? No, no, Israel isn't on the scene yet. God is just now beginning to deal with him. There's no law. There's not even circumcision yet. And so the relationship between this man who is not yet part and parcel of the nation of Israel is the most high God. Verse 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now you have almost the same kind of language in Matthew concerning Christ, how that he too was Lord of all. All right, verse 20. Blessed be the Most High, who hath delivered thine enemies in thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me thy persons, and so on and so forth. Now, once more in verse 22, Abram again said to the king, I lift up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, now I've already touched on the one in Psalms a thousand years later, but nothing associated with it. It's just that God designates the Messiah, the Son of God, as the one who will be Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. All right, now then, in the moments we have left, let's flip back to Hebrews, if you will. Chapter 7. Now let's just drop into verse 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, which of course we know, and I've made reference to that in previous programs, that the giving of the 10% or the tie began with Abraham in Genesis, it funneled into the law as part of the Levitical provision. And uh, then, of course, the Apostle Paul tells us that we're not under law. 
We're under grace, which takes away the responsibility of the 10% in our giving. Now Paul says that we give as the Lord lays on our heart. Big difference. And there is no demand to give a flat 10%. But that's beside the point in this program. We want to go on now that he is the king of righteousness. He's holy. He's omnipotent. But here's the part I want to spend the next few moments on. He is the king of Salem, which, like I said a moment ago, are the last letters of Jerusalem or the city of peace, which is to say the king of peace. Now, I want you to stop and think for a moment. Same with all of you out there in television. Stop and think. In all the thousands of years that we know Jerusalem has been on the scene, beginning with Abraham in 2000 B.C., how many days of peace has Jerusalem enjoyed? Not one. Not one. It has been a city of turmoil from day one. And especially especially in the last 2,000 years. Just stop and think of all the various empires that have overrun Jerusalem. It has been anything but the city of peace. And then especially when Israel came back into the land after World War II and fought their war of independence in 1948, Jerusalem was besieged again as she had been over and over up through the centuries. Bloodshed and mayhem. Unbelievable that the city of peace has never enjoyed peace. Well, look at her tonight. Look at Jerusalem tonight. Is it a city of peace? Anything but. It's in constant turmoil. Well, you have to almost ask yourself, why? When God has designated it as the city of peace, why has it been a constant city of turmoil? Well, again, what do we have to do? Patiently wait. God has promised that it's going to be a city of peace. Do you believe it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I know one time in one of our tours, we have a rather orthodox Jewish guy. And at breakfast one morning, I asked him, when will you settle all of these Middle Eastern problems? And I'll never forget. His chubby finger said, when he comes. And he's so right. There will be no peace in Jerusalem. I don't care who tries to broker it. There will be no peace in the city of peace until Christ returns. And so a logical prayer for us is, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.